Curious if there are any sports fans here today. Any, just a few, no one on this side. Okay, it's all sports. Uh, any Bruins fans? You can, you can be honest and, and I'm very sorry. Last 59 seconds, overtime, very, it was tough to watch. What about the Celtics? Let's, uh, let's give it up for the Celtics. I'm definitely all in on the Celtics. Although I grew up in New York, obviously a Knicks fan, I went through a very serious conversion process and I was accepted into the ranks of the Celtics. Uh, if you are not keeping score, started off as a pretty tough week on Sunday and Tuesday. And luckily with a few minutes left on Thursday, Mayor, the Celtics were able to pull it out and uh, tie the series with game seven tomorrow. Now, everyone watches a sports game differently if you do watch one. I am very superstitious. And so when I'm watching a sports game, I am sitting there totally focused at the edge of my seats. I make a, Jews usually don't cross themselves, so I don't cross my fingers. I, I make a little Magain David, a star of David, out of my fingers and like shoot that positive energy through the TV. I also don't knock on wood because Jews uh, traditionally don't do that. That's the wood of the cross. But Jews used to spit three times behind them. I don't know who came up with this custom. It's not COVID safe. So it became just kind of two, 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 something like that. Remove the bad outcomes, the kinaharas, any bad thing. Kinahara is a Yiddish word for kit ayin hara, like the evil eye. So you want to push away the evil eye and be safe. My grandmother, may her memory be for a blessing, lived through uh, horrors in what is now Ukraine during World War I. And when she came to America, she was so passionate about this country that it had given her safety and freedom that she wanted to drop her Yiddish accent. And the best way she thought to drop it was to adopt a British accent. Because how much more American can you be than to be British? So everyone was watching the uh, coronation last week. So... She still couldn't leave behind her superstitions and her Jewish superstitions and customs. So as I've shared with some of you, she Americanized the phrase Kinahara to Canary. So she would say every time you said something like, it's going to be fine, Grandma, she would say, Oi, don't give me a Canary. Because the impulse to superstition is real. That lens of seeing the world through being a little bit uncertain is something we all experience. I can't tell you how many times I've watched a baseball game and the announcer says something like, this batter has not struck out in 10 games. Of course, immediately then he strikes out. This happened the other night at the Celtics game. Celtics, the announcer said, are perfect from the line 10 for 10. I just shook my head and said, the next one's going to be a missed free throw. Of course, it was. It seemed pretty simple to me. Cause and effect. Whatever the announcer said, if you gave an evil eye, I can up. And as a kid, I totally believed this. My prayers would have an impact on the game. My superstitious incantations, if I did them strongly enough, they would cause my team to win. If I wasn't praying hard enough, my team would definitely lose. And of course, now that I'm older, I don't, you know, I don't really think it's true. Right, well, maybe like a little bit, but don't tell anyone. Now, this Torah certainly believed in this. Your actions, what you do, have a difference and can change the entire world in a very concrete way. The Torah says there is reward and punishment. And the second Torah reading in this morning's uh, 
of this morning's two parshiot, Parashat Bechukotai, says it very simply. Im Bechukotai telechu, the im mitzvotai tishmeru. If you walk in my statutes, statutes, my laws, and keep my commandments and do all of them, you'll have rain in a due season at the appropriate time. The land shall yield its increase. The trees of the field will all yield their fruit, and I will give peace to the land. You shall lie down, and none shall make you afraid. Isaiah picks up on this. I will remove the evil beasts out of the land, and neither sword nor sorrow shall go through the land. Nice and simple. You keep your end of the bargain, and God will reward us. I pray really hard the Celtics could win tomorrow. Of course, then I was thinking about it. Let's say there's a rabbi in Philadelphia. And the rat rabbi's praying very hard. All right, that's a problem. And then the Torah goes on to say, if you don't keep my commandments, I will appoint over you terror, consumption, and fever that shall consume the eyes and cause sorrow of the heart, and you shall sow your seed in vain, for your enemies shall eat it, and I will set my face against you, and you shall be slain before your enemies. They that hate you shall reign over you, and you will flee when no one's even pursuing you. Whew. Scary stuff. Be worse than the Celtics losing. Not to give them a Kanahara either way. The Torah is trying to make sense of the world and the way that it experiences the world. There are all of these dangers, there are blessings, and there are curses. And the Torah is trying to tie all of them to our actions. Rabbi Harold Kushner, may his memory be for a blessing, a great uh, author, rabbi, writer, who wrote our Eitz Chaim commentary that's in our Umashim that we were just looking at during the Torah reading, who just passed away two weeks ago. He wrote in his incredibly popular and important book, When Bad Things Happen to Good People, he said he can't believe in this traditional notion of reward and punishment. And he said, instead, I have a different conception of God. God as a cheerleader. Right? We have free will. Rabbi Kushner said, we can control our own actions. And sometimes those lead to devastating effects. Think of gun violence and the environment and wars. But we cannot control everything evil. Rabbi Kushner had no way to explain, no way to explain that the, the disease that his own son was born with, a deadly genetic disease. As he asked, what could my son have possibly done to deserve this? So instead, Rabbi Kushner imagined God as a, more like a cheerleader, urging us to do good, supporting us when we don't, or when bad things happen. But God does not actually get onto the field and play. God does not actually jump into the action and change the outcome for us. God will not help Al Horford hit the three-pointer. Now, I can't speak for all of you, but I'll speak for myself, and maybe for many modern people who would say, this is how I also look at the world, how I look at blessings and evil. And it's even how some of our ancient thinkers looked at this idea. In the Talmud, it states that the world follows its natural course. Olam kemin hago nohe. The world follows its own course, meaning that God does not intervene. God does not prevent bad things from happening to good people. Now, there are many ways to interpret and reinterpret our texts that are challenging like this. The same idea that we find that I just read to you is also find, found in our liturgy, a quote from the book of Deuteronomy, the second paragraph of the Shema. We read it plainly, though, we might find another way to understand it. If we keep the mitzvot, about protecting the environment and the earth, 
then the earth will sustain us. And if we don't, then we see what's happening. It's all around us. I appreciate that view. And then also another view that I like to point out, that the mitzvot are a reward in themselves. If we follow these traditions, these commandments, if we fulfill them, then we live a life of meaning and purpose. Then we live a moral and ethical life. But if we do not, then we lose out on those traditions that help us live with a sense of wonder and appreciation. We lose out on those commandments that help us stay on track and behave in good ways. Now, today I want to offer just one more take, maybe a different take on this notion of reward and punishment on cause and effect. I want to think about the original theology. Why was it created? And why did people believe in it? And I see it coming out of one powerful place, the emotion of fear, the most powerful of human emotions. People experienced and were experiencing the fear that existed in the world. The world can be very challenging. We see suffering. And for our ancestors, they, ancestors, they wanted an explanation. Why is this going on? Why am I sick? Why am I suffering? Why do I see suffering of others? And so they turned to their belief in God. They believed that there must be some higher power in control. And this gave them a measure of comfort, especially since they knew they were not in control. Today, now, we understand much more about the world. We understand that a genetic disease is not caused by any action of ours. It's an accident of nature. And of course, these accidents have real and terrible suffering. But I don't see this as God punishing us. I strive to see a God, a divine power, whose presence is saturating this world with kind of spiritual energy, which is not always easily accessed. It's everywhere, this energy, including maybe for most of us deep inside us. But we often don't slow down, and become aware of it. We don't often remove our own clipote, as the Kabbalists talk about, our own shells, our own blockers, our own impediments to feel that deeper sense of the divine. I think when we manage to do that, then we actually become conduits for this teaching, for this presence, for God's presence in this world. And we can live a fulfilling life. Not that we can control everything, but on what we can control, our own reactions, our own behaviors. Our fear is about not being able to control the world, not being able to make sense of it. Sometimes as we experience life and get older, we realize that we cannot manage it to our will. We cannot cope with all of our suffering of illness, of, as we say in Yiddish, all the tsuris, all the problems. And we learn to live with that difficult reality. We do not cause all the good and evil, all the good and bad in our world, nor does God. We have free will. There are accidents of nature. And the very fact that we live in a material world that can break down, it's fragile, all guarantee that there will be results that are not fair, things that are just not falling into the way the world should be. But I think there's a yearning that's deep down, a yearning to understand why I'm feeling this way, a yearning to make this world a little bit more comprehensible. And therefore, maybe we can try to help us cope with the fact that we can't control it all. This parasha reminds us to try to do our best to make the right choices to control what we can. And then I think we can actually hold on to both of these truths. For me, I look at the world through this logical, scientific, philosophically consistent, at least in my mind. I look at the world through that lens. 
But at the same time, I acknowledge that there's other, there's another part of me, this part that wants to pray, that wants to feel like I can have more of a connection to what's going to happen. This side of me is, is more emotional, maybe more spiritual, even superstitious. God may not reward us with a Celtics win on Sunday, but I will be praying very hard. Open the announcers, do not give the Celtics a Kanahara or even a Canary. Shabbat Shalom.